Welcome back to Machine Learning. This video will cover the perceptron. So far, in terms of supervised classification, we have covered the decision tree and k-nearest neighbors. With decision trees, we sort features by their importance for the classification problem. We do that by choosing the feature that gives the best information gain at each split. This greedy approach chooses the most important feature first, and the second most important feature next, and so on. This is a good approach and it works well, but it only orders the features in terms of importance. It doesn't tell us exactly how important they are. With k-nearest neighbors, we take a geometric view of the data, and so each feature is an axis in this view. Each feature is treated as equally important because all of our predictions are based off of distance in this space defined by the features. What if we want to know exactly how important each feature is? Well, we can use what is called the perceptron. The idea with the perceptron is to give every feature a weight. This weight gives a sense of how important the feature is for the classification problem. The perceptron is loosely biologically inspired. The perceptron is the simplest form of a neural network, and deep learning is just large neural networks. We will talk more about neural networks in other videos. How is a perceptron biologically inspired? Brains up are made up of units called neurons, and the rate of firing of a neuron tells us how activated it is. So some of the terminology is certainly biologically inspired, and from a very, very high level perspective, it is. But we have no idea how the brain works, not really. So we're making a lot of assumptions to simplify the problem and make it more computational. The perceptron looks something like this. The model and the algorithm are both called perceptron. The model is really just this green neuron and its incoming connections. So I will use those terms interchangeably to describe the model. The algorithm is called the perceptron algorithm, and I will cover this in a minute. We have the input features here, which are represented by the blue circles, and they each have their own connection to the green neuron. These connections correspond to the feature weights. We have D features. So in the cases where we were looking at k-nearest neighbors and we could actually plot the data, we had one or two features. So D was one or two, depending on the dimension we were in. So D represents the dimension of the feature vector. We represent a sample by its feature vector x. See, it has the little bar over it to denote that it's a vector. Now we see that the feature vector is just D individual features, x1, x2, all the way to xd. Each feature has its own weight, w1, w2, to wd, respectively. Now we see that a function has shown up in the neuron. All this is is the weighted sum of features. We sum from 1 to d the product of wi, xi. This is just a weighted sum. It's quite simple. Remember, these are the features, x1 to xd, and these are the weights for each feature, w1 to wd. And this summation in the neuron is called the activation of the neuron. What is our model? The activation function, which here is just the weighted sum, and the weights. Let's look at the activation function. Again, it's just a weighted sum. If a is greater than zero, then we output positive, or 1, or whatever you've decided is the value of your positive class. If a is less than or equal to 0, then you output negative, or negative 1, or 0. Let's run through an example to get the idea of it. We start with the following feature vector, 4, 1, negative 1, 3, and the associated weights, 1, 3, negative 3, and 2. Let's calculate the activation for this sample. Remember that the activation is calculated like this as a weighted sum of the input features. Plugging in our numbers, we get 1 times 4 plus 3 times 1 plus negative 3 times negative 1 plus 2 times 3. Adding all that up gives us 16. What do we do with 16? Well, it's greater than 0, so we output positive. This sample has been predicted to be a member of the positive class. So what are the weights exactly? Let's look at an example we're familiar with, specifically the sunny greater than 90 degrees example from when we first learned about decision trees. We have two features here and a label. These two features become x1 and x2. If we set w1 equal to 0 and then calculate the activation, we get that the activation relies entirely on the value of x2. So if w1 equals 0, then we're saying don't pay any attention to whether or not it's sunny outside. 
make your prediction solely based on whether or not it's greater than 90 degrees. So we're effectively ignoring our first feature. What happens if we set W1 equal to 10,000? We calculate the activation and we see that X1 will dominate the equation. So we're effectively saying, give a significant amount of attention to the feature sunny when making your decision about whether or not to go outside. What happens if we set W1 equal to negative 10,000? Then we're saying that it's very important that it is not sunny because otherwise we will not go outside. So these weights have an intuitive meaning. When they're large and positive, that feature is important for a positive prediction. When they're large and negative, the feature is important for a negative prediction. And when they're close to zero, that feature is not very important. Remember, we said that if A is greater than zero, we output positive, And if A is less than or equal to zero, we output negative. Well, sometimes it's nice to not have to rely on zero as our threshold, so we add a threshold T instead and predict if positive if A is greater than T and negative if A is less than or equal to T. But mathematically, it's nice to have our activation function set equal to zero so we can have the same threshold effect by adding a so-called bias term. So now we're still only interested in zero as our threshold and we have a new additive term, B. Here is our perceptron. This is what it looks like with our new bias term, B. This is our model. What are the parameters of this model? The weights. Remember that the parameters of a model are those that are learned as a part of model training. We will use the training data to determine these weights and also the bias. How do we learn the weights? We use error-driven learning. Think about this like when you study for an exam. If you're taking a history class or something where there's a lot of terms to memorize, you might make flashcards. You review all the flashcards once, and then when you go through the second time, you'll start to get some right. If you get them right, you might put them in a separate pile that you don't review again. So you're constantly reviewing the ones you're getting wrong and ignoring the ones you got right. That's exactly how the perceptron algorithm works. You only update when you make a mistake. Otherwise, you'll just continue on your merry way. This is also called an online algorithm. It's just a term that's used to describe an algorithm that looks at one sample at a time. Here's the algorithm. I'm going to go through this in English first, step by step, so we get it. The algorithm is taken directly from the textbook for class. First, we initialize the weights and bias to zero, so we just set everything equal to zero. For some number of epochs, or until convergence, there are two things here, epochs and convergence. One iteration of an algorithm is one sample, so think of it as reviewing one note card. You've reviewed one note card and you've completed one iteration of studying. But what really matters is how many times you go through all the note cards or all the samples. That is what's called an epoch. So each time you run through the entire set of samples, you've completed one epoch. Some people call it epic. I say epoch. It's really up to you. Now convergence. The perceptron algorithm is guaranteed to get 100% on the training data, so long as the data is linearly separable. That means if we can draw a line between the positive points or a plane or a hyperplane, then the data is linearly separable. If there is even just one pesky point that you can't completely separate, then it's not linearly separable. But if it is, then the perceptron is guaranteed to get all the training data right. And once that happens, the algorithm has converged. We take a training sample, x, y. We compute the activation for that sample. We check if the label times the activation is less than or equal to zero. If it is, we update the weights. Why is this? Well, if our label is negative and our activation is positive, that means the perceptron predicted incorrectly, so we should update. Multiplying them together simply tells us whether or not the label and activation are different signs. We update the weights using these two equations, w equals w plus y times x, and b equals b plus y. Why do we update the weights and bias in this way? Let's look more closely at it. Let's take an example where our perceptron got it wrong. Let's use a negatively labeled sample, for example, and say our activation was greater than zero. This means we have to update. Remember, the activation is simply the weighted sum of w's times i's, w's times x's. This is the same as the dot product between w and x, plus the bias. Let's assume we're working on one dimension for now to make it easier to interpret. So we have just one feature per sample, x1. So we update w1 with w1 plus negative one times x1, and b with b 
minus 1. Now let's calculate our new activation to see if this update got us closer to making a correct prediction for this sample. Plugging in our update equations into our activation function, we get a new, which is our new activation, equals w1 minus x1 times x1 plus b minus 1. Combining the terms, we get a new equals w1 x1 minus x1 squared plus b minus 1. If we move the terms around, we get a new equals w1 x1 plus b minus x1 squared minus 1. This is equal to the old a minus x1 squared minus 1 x1 squared is positive, so we're subtracting two positive numbers from a to get a new. And remember, we're trying to predict a negative sample, so we have a new is less than a, which is great. We're heading towards a correct prediction. Now back to the algorithm. We want to remember to randomize the order in which we look at samples. If we don't, we could end up looking at all the positive samples first and skewing our algorithm. It will eventually get to the right answer, but if the data isn't randomized, it will take longer. Imagine if you were studying and you had all the easy cards at the beginning and all the hard cards at the end. You'd think you were doing really well and then get a reality check halfway through. We want to keep it more balanced with positive and negative feedback. That's basically the whole algorithm. Once it converges, we just return the weights and bias. Let's run through an example. We have 10 samples, 5 positive, green plus signs, and 5 negative, red dots. I have numbered the samples randomly, so we will go through this order to train our perceptron. We start with our weights and bias set to zero. Let's start epoch one with sample one, which is at three, three. This is labeled as negative. We calculate the activation. With weights and bias of zero, we always get an activation of zero on the first sample. I'm using subscripts on my activations just so that we can keep track of what sample we're calculating the activation for. This is not at all required. Remember that we need to multiply the activation times the label, and doing that gives us zero. Zero is less than or equal to zero, so we need to update. Remember our update equations. I've put them at the top left corner of the slide so you have them handy. We recalculate w1, w2, and b using these equations and the label and feature values for sample one. Our w1 is now negative three, our w2 is now negative three, and our b is negative one. Now we move on to sample two, which is negative two, three, and it has a positive label. We calculate the activation and we get 14. Multiplying 14 with the label one gives us 14, which is greater than zero, so we don't need to update. On to sample three at two negative one with a negative label. We calculate our activation again and we get negative four. Negative four times one is greater than zero, so we don't have to update. Sample four now. We have a feature vector of two, two and a label of negative one. Calculating the activation for sample 4 gives us negative 13. Negative 13 times a label of negative 1 gives us 13, which is greater than 0, so we don't have to update. Sample 5 has a feature vector of negative 3, negative 1, and a label of 1. Calculating the activation for sample 5 gives us 11. 11 times the label of 1 gives us 11, which is greater than 0. Again, we don't have to update. On sample 6, which is at negative 3, 1, and has a label of positive one. Calculating the activation for this sample gives us five. Five times a label of one gives us five, which is greater than zero, no update. Sample seven at one one has a negative label. We calculate the activation, which gives us negative seven. With a label of negative one, the activation times the label is greater than zero, so we don't have to update. Sample eight has a feature vector of negative two, negative one, and a label of positive one. Calculating the activation gives eight. Eight times a label of one gives one, gives eight, which is greater than zero. So again, we don't update. On to sample nine at three, one. The activation for sample nine is negative 13. Times a label of negative one gives 13, which is greater than zero, no update. On to our final sample in our first epoch, 10, at negative one, negative one, with a positive label. The activation for sample 10 is five. Five times the label of positive one gives five, which is greater than zero, so we don't update. 
We have completed our first epoch because we have reviewed every sample. On to our second epoch. The algorithm has converged once we have completed a full epoch without updating the weights and bias. Back to sample one. Calculating the activation for sample one gives us negative 19. Negative 19 times a label of negative one gives 19, which is greater than zero, so we don't have to update. Samples 2 through 10 have already been tested with these weights, so that's a full epoch of no updates. So the algorithm converges with these weights and bias. The perceptron gives a linear decision boundary, whether that's a line, a plane, or a hyperplane. A hyperplane is just a plane in a dimension greater than 3. What is the decision boundary? It's just the set of points where the prediction goes from positive to negative or vice versa. In two dimensions, if we have a linear decision boundary, then we can visualize it as a line that separates the two classes. Let's plot our decision boundary. Looking at our weights and bias, we can look at our prediction like this, y hat, which just denotes our prediction rather than the label, equals w1x1 plus w2x2 plus b. With our specific w and b, we get y hat equals negative 3x1 minus 3x2 minus 1. Setting our y hat to 0, we get negative 3x1 minus 3x2 minus 1 equals 0. We can solve this for x2. We're basically trying to get an equation in the form we're familiar with. So I'm going for y equals mx plus b. So I can find the slope and y-intercept, or x2 intercept in this case. We have a slope of negative 1 and a y-intercept of negative 1 third. So we can plot it like this. W actually describes the vector perpendicular to the decision boundary, and it points in the direction of the positive class. Now we have a trained model. Since we have our weights and bias, testing is easy. We take a sample, compute the weighted sum, the dot product between W and X, and add the bias and predict the sign of the activation. If we take this example of the point 0, 0, we calculate our activation and we get negative 1. The sign of negative 1 is negative 1. So this point is predicted as being part of the negative class. The perceptron algorithm always converges if the data is linearly separable. In this example, our data was linearly separable, so we were able to find a W and B that correctly classified every point in the data set. Remember, the model is the weights and bias, and it's just this little neuron with connections, and the algorithm is based on error-driven learning. That's pretty much it for perceptrons. Our next topic will cover linear classifiers more broadly.